Okay, so I start with the microcore progress. Uh, there is not too much, but interesting stuff. So finally, microcore has been published on GitHub. URL see above. Uh, as a second measure, uh, because the whole cross compiler still uh, relates deeply, uh, re depends deeply on GeForce 062, um, Uli wrapped it into a Docker file. Uh, but then in the end, when everything was working fine in uh, Linux, it turned out to be completely useless because for Windows 10 because uh, Microsoft on, on, on the Microsoft Docker you are not uh, it is not possible to connect to the serial interface so um, you could not debug microcore. This is why I'm still waiting for a final uh, for a final GeForce 1.0, which and in, in which case I will sit down and rewrite the cross compiler to load on GeForce 1.0. So up to that point, up to that time, um, sorry, uh, GeForce can uh, uh, microcore can only be uh, debugged on Linux uh, using either the Docker file or loading the or original GeForce 062, which should also be possible. So I thought in order to support uh, the Internet of Things, uh, a 10 base T Ethernet interface would be fine. I chose 10 base T because I didn't want to use an external uh, physical FI. Uh, these little, I don't know, 24 pin devices that handle the physical side of it um, because they are extremely power hungry. And I wanted to get away with less power. So my 10 base T interface just uses a couple of passive components as phi and everything else as far as 10 base T is concerned is realized inside the FPGA consuming about 500 uh, logical whatever LUTS means logical something or other. Uh, it consumes 500 as a reference point, microcore itself, and for testing I'm also using, always using a 27-bit data work width. Um, it, the the microcore itself consumes 2000 LUTs, so you can see um, the 10 base T is a substantial sized interface. And then on the software side, I set out that my devices, or I will do the code that allows to do UDP messaging and the configuration of the, uh, inter of, of the microcore node using reverse ARP. Reverse ARP means there is a host computer and the host computer has a table of um, MAC numbers and internet addresses. And the first thing that the microcore node does, it does an ARP call and that, that supplies uh, the microcore node with its IP address and also at the same time with the IP address and the MAC address of the host, and then the host, the communication between the uh, microcore node and the host uh, is possible using uh, 10 based T internet. And the all the code needed to realize ARP and UDP consumes to to my I mean, to my delight, only 2030 instructions, and that includes the multitasker as well.
um, that is a very slim implementation. And uh, plus, I did quite a number of things differently than they are usually done. I have no buffers, uh, so big buffers in the system that I use to buffer the incoming uh, internet frames. Instead, all the checking whether this is an internet frame that is really needed for the node is done in the FPGA. And then the message that gets received is stuffed into uh, a FIFO from which then the foreground process that does all the UDP processing um, just has to access the, uh, the FIFO. And uh, that minimizes that minimizes to a large extent uh, that uh, the software has to figure out whether a message that has been received is really meant for this node, and uh, all kinds of nasty things that can go wrong. And uh, unfortunately, Stephen is not listening. He can tell you. Uh, nice stories about what, what happens if you connect um, an inter an, uh, uh, UDP protocol uh, to the World Wide Web. It crashes the system in no time. With this implementation, I'm quite sure that cannot happen. So any questions so far? No? Okay. Then I come to the linguistic aspects, which I think um, is much more interesting. So I did all of this because I talked to a computer science student um, who uh, took linguistics as uh, a second study topic. And then I started to think about, I mean, what about the linguistics of force itself? And force has some, some features that should make it very interesting for linguists. To, because what the linguists usually do, they have a text and they want to analyze this under linguistic, uh, how do you say this, linguistic uh, aspects. And then they use some programming language uh, that they have to use. Well, in force, you can apply linguistic principles to your programs themselves. And so let's see what that means. The stack. Force has no parameter lists because input and output arguments use a stack. We all know this, but why is this, I mean, why is this so exceptional? Because the, the ramification of this is that several words can be written on a single line. You cannot do that with conventional languages because of the uh, well of the oh the stack. Sorry, I'm getting mixed mixed up here. Um. No, I'm, I, I'm, I'm missing here my, my major argument, and that is not, yeah, this is not, so I have to, I have to tell you, this is not part of the presentation. Uh, what is exceptional about force? It doesn't have parameter lists. And in conventional programming languages that do not have a stack, you always have parameter lists for procedures. And so the, Parameter lists are cluttering your program more or less, and the result of which is that you usually do one procedure call per line. Instead, force doesn't need the, param the, the parameter list, so you can 
use a horizontal programming style and the horizontal programming style, we all know we do phrases and sentences in force. As a ramification, we can put more code on a screen, which significantly reduces the need to scroll during debugging, which gives you a big advantage because you see more on the screen at once. And it allows to write readable code that is comprehensible by system engineers because no parameter lists garble the flow. And uh, so you can put some um, aesthetics into writing your code in order to make it nicely readable. And all old force hands know what that means. And uh, Every programmer knows how important it is to find the right name for something you want to express. So these are the two benefits of the stack. And then we also have the parser. Uh, very similar to book reading, false lexical scanner only looks out for wait space which is also something that most other programming languages don't do. Which means, and, and the ramification of this is, that names can be composed of any printable character. And that opens up a whole universe or a whole new dimension uh, for signification of names by using the special characters in that you apply a certain meaning to like the greater or less sign uh, C to R and R from and, 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 the, and, and the same ilk. And so you have already your, the, the names in force can carry more meaning than the names in other programming languages. Unless, I mean, you write names that take almost half a line in the code. And if I look at uh, languages like, oh, what, what, what is a contemporary? Uh, you know, I'm getting old and, 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 and sometimes I don't remember names uh, and words. Uh, So what I saw in, in contemporary programming is that the names become terribly long, which means uh, not only do you have to type a lot, but um, I, this is the second reason why uh, you do not fit more than one procedure call on a line, uh, because the names are so long. And in, in that respect, uh, Force has, has big advantages, and you can apply linguistic principles and, 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 and compose nice reading programs because the language doesn't get into your way. And note it besides, uh, also, Force does not need regular expressions for its parser. Um, I asked myself, I mean, why do other programming languages have lexical scanners which look for more than just white space? And the only explanation I came up with is Fortran and COBOL have the first, have been the first high level languages that existed. And they existed at the time when your source code had to be punched into cards. And every character on a punch card was costly. So omitting unnecessary spaces was considered to be a good means for compre code compression. And it seems to me that 
this habit has been inherited and taken for granted and not questioned, but by Chuck Moore, um, from that time on. And therefore, you can still uh, write one plus two without spaces in between, which makes the lexical scanner complex and doesn't give you any more functionality. Plus, it makes reading the code more difficult. So these are the two features of force which I uh, which which I found that are important as far as linguistics is concerned and which kind of uh, are unique to force more or less. Uh, I'm sure there are other programming languages who do that do similar things, but I'm not aware of them. So that's that's what I wanted to say. Questions, remarks. If there's any questions in on Twitch, please put them in the chat now. Are there any questions in Big Blue Button? Please raise your hand. Oh, Bob wants to say something. Bob wants to say something. You have hit on exactly why I've. Um, worked so hard to create APL in fourth because APL is also a language which is sentence oriented but one of its major lacks is both the simplicity of the RPN um, um, sit fundamental RPN syntax but also the white space is the prime delimiter um, APLs are far more difficult to read and and they're, they're caught in this notion of having some uh, sort of central committee defined a set of symbols the, and the, the, the freedom to create a word out of any uh, non-blank, non-white non space uh, set of symbols is just an enormously larger space than what you have to create words in APL, and that's that's one of the, the tremendous freedoms of it. So you've you've said an awful lot of stuff that is it's it's about having a linguistic interface instead of a a, a, a menu and and icon interface. Um, you have to be able to write a sentence to be able to control your your computing environment. <laughs> That's my rant. Thank you, Bob. Bob. Uh, any further questions or statements? Um, yeah, maybe from me. Uh, I'm not sure whether whether the, the pure space saving uh, has been the, the the key driver of the the special character slash. Uh, Regex scanner driven structure of uh, of most languages what what I see is I, I agree with most most what you said uh, what I see <clears throat> is uh, that Chuck Moore was the first to have this this idea that you could actually get something like a semantic structure into 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 a program uh, through the use of the stack so basically, in um, <clears throat> making implicit the the relation between different parts of the program, which everywhere else you do through uh, operators and equal signs and uh, uh, all the special characters that we uh, that we know and uh, sometimes love and sometimes hate. So I'm I'm not sure whether it's a it's a space saving thing. Um, one parallel later uh, development that I noticed was uh, from Pascal to C, um, the language became less verbose. So uh, where Pascal uses words, C uses uses uh, symbols, characters, uh, which I don't think was motivated by any uh, characters are expensive reason, but rather by it's quicker to read once you've got the trained eye and it's quicker to type. 
Um, my, my guess would rather be that um, nobody had an idea how to create this kind of rich structure into a language without syntactic help, if you, if you will. So beyond that, I'm, uh, I think you said it, said it very well. Now, yeah, but it still doesn't explain uh, why, I mean, at the time when Fortran and Cobol was created, uh, a complicated, I mean, just the lexical scanner was much more complicated than what, what Chuck did. Why did they do that? Why the heck did they do that? It, I find it so unnecessary. And of course, I mean, the, the, even Fortran and Cobol gives you the freedom you can stick in the blanks where Force had them as well. But uh, usually nobody does that. In, in the APL world, um, this is a, an issue in, in writing K, which is, is the direct predecessor, you know, where I'm coming from. Um, I don't like the idea that, in a sense, the computer knows more about parsing what's in front of you than you do. And just having white space as this prime delimiter goes and puts you on an equal footing with your computer. There's no, nothing behind the scenes that is, that is, has got rules that you may not understand. And without question, in both, uh, APL has gotten extreme in the, in the mixing of syntax with meaning in ways that just are, you know, you really, that ends up being your focus of what you try to f solve, figure out, to go and be able to express something, as opposed to the, the brilliant simplicity that, that, that Chuck had of just having white space be the prime delimiter. Right. If you uh, wanted to build something that parsed words within that, you could, but. Okay, thank you, Bob. Glyn has his hand up for quite a while. Yeah, just um, related to the previous, eh? one observation is that in a language like C, uh, adjacency with or without punctuation uh, implies passing, uh, passing parameters to an argument, whereas in fourth, you're composing blocks of code. The adjacency implies a composition of code rather than, uh, rather than applying arguments, which is where some of this kind of elegance and conciseness comes from. And I think, as Bob was saying, like J and K, if I remember rightly, have a similar thing, although it's a long time since I looked at either of them, uh, which are both APL descendants. Okay. There's also a statement from Twitch, from Estrope. Never did Fortran or COBOL, but I think they tried to mimic human language a bit too hard and APL tried to mimic mass notation a bit too hard. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess we can agree with that. Uh, Peter, please, uh, you also had your hands up. Well, that goes back to Fortran, which really was developed by mathematicians. And mathematicians have no concept of syntax whatsoever. Everything in mathematics is symbolic. So they, it, the mathematicians very much went down the symbol route. And that's where a lot of the notation, particularly from uh, Fortran, APL, and C, for that matter, a lot of that notation comes from the mathematical world. Yeah, yeah wait a second, Peter. But I mean, in, in mathematical texts, is there not a space right and left of the plus sign in infix notation? Not necessarily. There doesn't. Ha there doesn't have to be. No, I mean in textbooks. What is the, the the common style? Well, unfortunately, the style there is there is space. It's called a slither. It's not as wide as a space. It's only a third of a space. Okay. Um, if you want to get pedantic about desktop publishing and all that sort of thing. Um, so, yes, there is space, but it's not a full-blown space. And uh, certainly back in the 60s, they really didn't have the capacity to do quarter spaces and that sort of silliness. 
Okay. And you would barely see a, a space between a function name and the function uh, brackets in a mathematical text. So those would be directly adjacent usually. Usually. Right. So Dirk, would you please uh, ask a question or a comment? Yes, I think um, uh, Peter has made uh, half of my point uh, already, but um, the relation to mathematician syntax uh, seems to me a very important consideration. Um, well, uh, it's no coincidence that um, C, for example, uh, resembles um, a mathematical function in terms of arguments uh, being be between brackets and so on. And if you think about it, explicit assignment for value to a variable is a, a very mathematical thing. So this is basically at the uh, at the bottom of, of algebra, algebra. So um, to pass stuff implicitly without having uh, been assigned to something that can't be named is a pretty unnatural thing um, for a mathematician um, to do. And uh, this is only, well, in, in language, I don't know enough about uh, comparative languages, but uh, uh, to my, in my feeling, the uh, the place where uh, the thought was actually liberated um, was in, in pure logic and lambda calculus um, uh, that was invented there. So this can actually do um, uh, probably without brackets and has a very, very special inspired syntax that resembles nothing you've seen from an ordinary um, algebra textbook. So that I think this is some of the reason um, how uh, <laughs> the, uh, the syntax you all complain about came into being. Right, okay, uh, thank you, gentlemen. I think we are going into quite a nice discussion which should be resumed in some other chat room. We have a other uh, presentation coming up. So uh, please, Nick, can you make a last a final statement or a question? Well, it, 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 that just brings up something which I've been contemplating doing for a little while now. Since we moved to Linux and we now have a standardized UTF-8 character set, this raises the possibility of creating fourth words in interesting symbols, which we were not able to use before. And this raises the possibility of improving the conciseness and re readability of the code. And so I haven't actually done any of that yet, but I'm very, very tempted to start doing that. And the only thing that's stopping me is the difficulty of actually typing these symbols. So I don't know whether anybody else has tried that yet, but it, from a point of view of readability, I think it had potential advantages. Well, certainly Bill comes to mind, which he has used all of the keys there are in UTF-8, and he's the mm -hmm. only one who's done so. Okay, thank you very much for this interesting discussion. Please uh, continue this discussion after the next presentation. And uh, uh, thank you very much, Klaus, for inspiring us with that. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm.